Hi, and welcome to another episode of Fashion Histories with me, Anita, from So What Manchester. Um, now, here in Manchester in the UK, um, it's the start of February and it is still really chilly. Um, so I thought I would share with you the origin stories of something we, well, most of us wear when it's a bit cold, the coat. Uh, so I've picked five different coats that are kind of staples of, um, you know, most people's wardrobes. Like most of us will have at least one of these types of coats um, in our wardrobes, uh, or you'll at least know what they are if someone showed you a picture of them. Um, so I thought I'd share with you like the a brief history of each one um, and like sort of how they came to be and um, how they came to be uh, popular in in fashion um, even up till today. So let's get into it. First up, the bomber jacket. Now, a uh, bomber jacket wasn't always called a bomber jacket. When it was first sort of invented, it was known as a flight jacket. And um, this was sort of in the early 1900s. And it was originally invented um, as a way to keep pilots, like air pilots, um, warm because originally like cockpits in planes weren't enclosed they were open can you imagine being like all that way up in the sky like how absolutely freezing it must have been um so yeah so it was to keep them warm especially during like world war one um the the sort of first version of the bomber jacket as it became to be known because obviously pilots uh, in the war were then, you know, dropping bombs from their planes. So that sort of changed its name slightly. Um, but the first versions were made of leather. So it's obviously really durable. Um, they didn't really, um, synthetic fabric wasn't a thing back then. Um, so they had to find like the most durable, the warmest, like, but also most comfortable fabric that would you know do everything they needed it to do and leather was just really just ticked all those boxes and they also had um a lot of them had sort of fur lined collars um and they originally had a button up fastening up the front which we can't really imagine now but that's how it started um but the fur lined collar would be to keep them extra warm sort of like if you zip that right up now like lovely warm on your neck um but it had um sort of a knitted bit like around the cuffs and around the waist because again you're up in the sky it is cold it is very windy and that being knitted kept it like close um close to your wrists and like kept all the air in just kept that insulation in um and stopped the wind um, and the cold being able to like get in and make you even colder than you already were. So eventually they moved from button fastenings to zip fastenings and the the sort of normal collar um, became just a knit collar as well, like the same as the, the cuffs and the waist. Um, and, you know, obviously as uh, technology evolved, um, you know, they had enclosed cockpits now, so you didn't need to be quite as cosy. And also with more and more stuff being in the cockpit and then being smaller and smaller, you needed a jacket that wasn't bulky and hard to move in. So the fabric got lighter, thinner. Um, and as with most of the coats that we're gonna talk about, um, what started off as a an item of military wear that was specifically designed for you know people in the army the air force you know that kind of thing um they got featured um in you know by people in films um so james dean in rebel without a cause war one 
Um, and so the bomber jacket became a fashionable item because the stars of the screen were wearing them and they tended to be quite rebellious and, you know, everything they stood for, um, they just looked really cool and they were wearing a bomber jacket. So of course, everyone else wanted to wear a bomber jacket to look cool. Um, I think one of the most famous modern versions is probably the one that um, Ryan Gosling wears in Drive. Like it's beautiful, it's like that satin bomber. Um, and they've become incredibly popular. Um, so that's the history of the bomber jacket, keeping it brief. Okay, next up is the puffer jacket. Um, now, you might think actually a puffer jacket and a bomber jacket are quite similar, but they, and I suppose they weren't invented too far apart from each other, like the idea might have already been there. Um, but the origin story of the puffer jacket is there was a guy called Eddie Bauer who, um, this is this is the legend was on a fishing trip and like fell into the water got soaked through um and nearly died of hypothermia if it hadn't been for him like ripping open a a sleeping bag or, or a blanket or something and stuffing um like feathers like down feathers like that's the really soft under feathers of of birds um especially seabirds, because for insulation, and like stuffing those um, in between his coat and his body to like try and warm him up. That's like, that's the legend. I don't know how true that bit is, um, but he is credited with inventing the puffer jacket um, in 1936. Um, so we've jumped ahead a little bit from when the bomber jacket was invented. Um, and essentially, the puffer jacket is quilted fabric, which is where you've got two layers of fabric and you you sew in, it's usually straight lines like um, or a, a grid pattern. Like think of your duvet at home, like a duvet is just a giant version <laughs> of a puffer jacket basically. Um, same goes for a sleeping bag. Um, but yeah, so quilting is just like, uh, getting two bits of fabric, they usually have something in between. Um, in the puffer jacket, it's it's really soft, light feathers. That's how it started, and you sew in like a grid pattern or whatever to trap air in in those little pockets um, that you've created. And what this creates is like little pockets of air. That provide you with the most amazing insulation against the cold, the wind, um, and so obviously for people um, who were doing quite extreme sports and things, and like hikers, um, you know, explorers, all you know, you can picture, can't you? Um, it was a really amazing invention for them because it. It meant that they didn't have to wear like a million layers um and before that people tended to wear wool clothing because it naturally let you your skin breathe even if you got sweaty or well whatever um and this coat this new invention of the coat meant that you could be warm um without having to wear a million layers um, and it was easy to like roll down. I suppose you could use it as a pillow if you really needed to. Um, and obviously as time went on, um, you know, technology moves on and the invention of synthetic fabric uh, came about, which meant that you didn't have to use like a million little baby like Ida feathers. So that's where Ida down comes from. Ida is a, a seabird and the down is like the the really soft, lovely feathers that they have. So that's where eider down comes from. That's the word. Um, and yeah, so uh, puffer jackets started to be filled with synthetic, um, like stuffing basically, 
um, which did the same job but was obviously a lot cheaper and easier and um, you know sleeping bags evolved in the same way because they basically had to do the same job like keep you warm uh, but you were sleeping in it and it was at night time and um, what we now know as the sleeping bag co came about because um, a designer called Norma Kamali in the 70s again I don't know how true this legend is but she was on a camping trip and she needed to go to the toilet in the middle of the night so she got up wrapped her sleeping bag around her and you know was really warm and was like oh actually this would make an amazing coat um and so she she actually decided to make that a thing and became incredibly successful off the back of it um and she was genuinely making coats out of actual sleeping bags to begin with um until her design evolved uh, but she is credited with the the sleeping bag coat or like the duvet coat that you see on nearly everyone today so it was very much practicality over like you know style as such um but when <laughs> i can't i saw a quote somewhere i'll have to find out where it was um but it said when you are stood on like a subway in America or like at the bus stop in Manchester in the middle of winter, um, do you really care what you look like if you are wrapped up in a lovely warm coat with your hood up? No, I don't think you do. Um, so yeah, in, and you know, the thing is, they are really cool now. I will say I had never owned a puffer jacket a puffer coat, I'd never owned a sleeping bag coat or a duvet coat, whatever you want to call it, the long version. Um, I'd never owned one until we got Luna, our dog, and my mum gave me her old one. Uh, she was like, this will see you through winter for dog walking. I said, oh my god, I am converted. Um, I'm so annoyed at myself for being so snobby, um, but they're amazing. So yes, yeah, so that's the history of the puffer jacket and we'll move on um, to something a bit sturdier um, and a lot older next. Right, I am going to talk to you about the pea coat. Um, I love pea coats. Um, they are um, like a classic piece of menswear um, and I just think they look brilliant on pretty much everyone. Um, I just absolutely love them um, but I am very much a fan of double-breasted coats in general um, and old school. Um, so the pea coat um, again has um, military uh, origins but from the Navy this time. So um, what we know now as a Pico is very much based on coats that, um, or like outerwear that sailors would have worn in like the 1700s up to like the 1800s. Um, and while you, you can never really say who invented this particular coat because it evolved so much over time, um, the name, um, it's believed comes from the Dutch name, um, which is Pijaka. So that is P-I-J, it's pronounced P. <laughs> um, and that was the word that they had for the fabric that this kind of coat was made from, like a really thick, durable fabric. And Yaka uh, just means like a, a short coat. Um, so that's where the name comes from. Uh, so that's why we call it a pea coat. Um, and again, um, the design of the coat was very much um, function over style, even though now I consider it to be like super stylish and very classic. Um, it was all about how it functioned for the sailor wearing it. Now, uh, before then, you would have had like long coats like tailcoats, all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're a sailor having to like climb up things, run around, like do a very practical job on a ship, 
you can't be wearing a long coat and also when it's wet that's just going to drag you down so the length of the coat was shortened um so that you had more movement for your legs um there was a flap at the back again um so that you weren't restricted in any way um it was the coat is double breasted um so that again like the wind can't get in um it just uh double breasted is when you've got a flap under here with buttons that then another flap comes over so you've got two rows of buttons um where a single breasted is just one but the wind can get right in there um whereas double breasted uh, you've got like two layers of fabric and they're overlapping and they're fastened in two places so it's much harder for that that breeze to get in and freeze you um so it keeps you a lot warmer um they've got um like vertical pockets down the side um so that again if you're kind of like on deck and you're freezing um they're you're just putting your hands right in and you're getting that body warmth and it'll warm your hands up much quicker and it's easier to get your hands in and out of those pockets than like a fancy flat pocket that you have to like undo the top and blah 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 so that's why the pockets are the way they are and again um the button fastenings are usually or definitely originally were very like oversized or those little like horn shapes um uh, like you get on parkers and stuff uh, and that was so that if your hands were really cold and wet they weren't like these tiny fiddly little fastenings like they were oversized so it was really much easier for you to fasten your coat up quickly and get warm um so this is um you know that obviously they continue to be worn like all the way through um like world war one world war two in some form or another but after world war ii you had all this military surplus gear that was no longer needed um that kind of made its way out into secondhand stores thrift stores in america um and uh in the you know sort of 50s 60s 70s that was when you know the culture of beatniks and hippies started up and they they wanted cheap clothing and there was all this like this huge amount of old military gear so they started picking up pea coats and that's why you know uh, a lot of the sort of hippies are seen wearing military gear um even though they were very much against that it's a really nice way of subverting it but that's how pea coats then became um sort of a fashionable item a cool item and now they're just like a classic piece of menswear um and obviously there's versions for women too um but it is kind of a, a menswear staple and they're wonderful i love them okie doke we're on to the macintosh um what we might call a rain mac today a raincoat um, was originally called a Macintosh, named after Charles Macintosh, who invented the technology that meant fabric could become waterproof. Now, um, this we're going back to the 1800s and rubber had been discovered by the Western world, um, like natural rubber, and they knew it was this amazing thing and they knew it could like be absolutely incredible if they could apply it to clothes to make them waterproof because they knew that that was a, a thing that rubber could do um but they just couldn't work out how to do it and in 1823 um a scottish man called charles mackintosh figured out the the technology and got a patent for it and how he did it was um he sealed i'm not going to go into the technicalities because i'm um, I'm not like a scientist um believe it or not um so he sealed um a layer of rubber in between two layers of fabric and sort of fused them together so that the fabric could then be used to make clothes and it was flexible it moved the same way fabric did 
but it had this layer of like this waterproof um, layer in between uh, so you could make clothes out of it and they wouldn't get wet and then soak all the water up and then you wouldn't be wet either oh my can you imagine this like what a revelation that you could wear clothes and you could go out in the rain and not get wet that had never happened before that wasn't a thing like you would always water would always find a way in and you'd have to like try and find a way of staying warm and dry now um Macintosh is still a company that is going today um and it's it's still I think like the actual fabric is produced by their company in Japan I think um but I believe the actual coats are still made in Scotland which is really cool um but the the way that these coats are made is absolutely incredible because if you think great the the fabric is waterproof but to make a coat out of that fabric it has to be cut and joined which means there are gaps like each seam is a gap that water can still get through like you can't waterproof air so they actually seal and like tape up every single seam on the inside so that every single seam is also waterproofed so just like um just think now about like you know if you have a raincoat any kind of waterproof um a mac that a lot of the time now they don't um they tend not to be stitched uh they tend to be like melted together like the seams um if you look on the inside you'll probably be able to see it better um unless it's lined um but that's to stop the water being able to get through and ruining the whole purpose of a waterproof coat um i just think it's absolutely magical that someone like just figured out how to do that and obviously technology has developed over time because like since the 1800s we're not still using like the same well actually on their website they do say the way they make the fabric today is very similar like pretty much the same as how they did it in the 1800s like if it ain't broke don't fix it but um our uh next and final coat um kind of leads on from this a little bit because if you look back at historical images of Macintosh coats like when they were first invented um they might look quite familiar so let's get on to our last coat okay last but definitely not least is my absolute favorite type of coat to wear is the trench coat um it's an absolute style classic um i i love a trench coat um it's isn't it weird uh, i always think of it as being um a classic piece of women's wear but actually it was originally very much men's wear um but that's fashion um so I, I just love the line of it the the details that are on them um I just they look so smart but they're so easy to wear um I just love them I think they're amazing and they are a lot older than you'd probably think so um they the trench coat evolved from the Macintosh um they kind of built on that technology um literally um uh, that's where Burberry comes from like Thomas Burberry took what Macintosh had done and was like oh, I feel like there's a better way to do this so instead of sandwiching rubber between two pieces of fabric he decided he was going to treat each strand of cotton before it was made into fabric and when he did this he this fabric was then known as gabardine which um if you can imagine like uh if you have uh like a normal like mac that's like rubberized it's not breathable like it, it can't be that it defeats a whole object whereas gabardine is 
breathe balm. So it's, I think it's classed more as weatherproof rather than waterproof. So it's water resistant, but it, because there's gaps in between the strands of, of thread, it can't be completely waterproof, but um, it does a pretty good job. Um, so he, um, Thomas Burberry, uh, at least patented this, maybe invented it before, but 1879 um, is when that came to be. How nuts is that? So old. Um, but I think like the idea had been around since like the 1850s. Um, it's just absolutely bonkers to think that something we still wear today is that old. Um, but there we go. Uh, so he, like I said, he took what Macintosh had already done and developed it. And if you look at old um, pictures of Macintosh-like advertisements, the actual style of the coat is is quite similar to a, what we know as a trench coat now. Um, so the style was already around. Burberry adapted it, um, as did Aqua Scutum. Um, and Aqua Water Scutum means shield, so that's where that brand name comes from. Um, um, the details on a trench coat, um, not all of them have survived to like modern, the modern trench coat, but originally the the extra details that were on there um, just made it absolutely perfect for uh, people in the army. Now, obviously the name trench coat, you would assume, as I had, um, before I looked into it deeper, you would assume it got its name from being worn by um, people in the trenches and soldiers uh, that were in in the trenches in World War One, which must have been horrific. Um, but they couldn't afford that. <laughs> they couldn't afford a trench coat. Uh, trench coats were apparently mainly worn by officers and higher ranks than that, who actually bought the trench coat out of their own money. It wasn't part of the standard uniform um, to kind of distinguish themselves as being of a higher rank, um, which, like I said, I didn't know about that, uh, but of course you have to bring class into warfare even. Um, and I'll talk you through some of the details that made this such a great coat for uh, people experiencing war. Um, officers anyway. Um, so first off, uh, you've got the fact that they were originally uh, double-breasted. So like the peacoat, it's for insulation, keeps you warm, uh, keeps you drier um, than if there was just that one layer. Um, so it stops the wind getting in and kind of stops the rain getting in as much as well. Um, it's belted, so um, but it tended not to be with a belt as far as I know because that was fiddly it was just like a they had d-rings um and again that pulls the, the coat tighter into your body and provides better insulation that way but the coat is long so your legs are protected so that wind factor isn't as bad um but it still has that slit up the back for movement um there's something called a storm flap which I had originally thought were the two bits at the front, but I don't think that is. I've only ever seen it on one trench coat that I would uh, I was given that was from like, I'm assuming the 80s. And I think the storm flap was like an extra bit of fabric that you could button to the side or you could button over that that bit where the collar is to like give extra insulation um but you still had ventilation um so that's really interesting that that isn't a thing that survived um because you don't need it anymore um but the the caped bit at the back um so when you look at a trench coat on the back there's like an extra an extra section of fabric um that sort of goes to maybe below your shoulder blades and uh, it's like a little cape and that allows the water that is hitting you to run off your back but it's an extra bit of fabric so it's running off rather than just hitting your back all the time and soaking through and 
again, not something that's really survived because it's it's not relevant anymore, but you used to have epaulettes on the top, um, which um, would have been used to sort of show what rank you were. Um, but also you do still sometimes get them where they had a little, a little loop on the shoulder that was like a button down loop, um, which some officers would have used to like, uh, they would have slid their gloves through there so that it was like their gloves were like safely sorted safely stored um but they were really easily accessible if they needed them um what else was there oh that was it um so the your belt would have d-rings um which it's uh like a side fastening um and they are literally shaped like a d that's that's it <laughs> um but you could hook things onto that really easily um so that was very practical and you you had the same thing around the cuffs like something like a strip of fabric that you could pull tight again to stop wind getting up but it meant that the coat could still be um roomy enough for you to like uh you know if you needed to be active and do something practical you could be now i just find it absolutely like all those little details that were just like but that's just a trench coat. They all had a reason for being there originally. Um, so next time you see one or see someone wearing one, just kind of notice how it's how it's constructed, how it's made. I just think they're wonderful. Um, again, what started off as a piece of um, military wear, very much associated with the war, um, that became quite a romantic thing like you know your soldier going off to war and like um you had people like um Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca now the scene where he's in a trench coat I think he's only in it like is there maybe two scenes in the whole film where he wears that now is it Casablanca or is it the Maltese Falcon oh my god my memory's completely gone uh, I'll have to double check that anyway. Um, so either way, he became very famous for wearing this, but it became, um, he helped it and other films of people wearing trench coats, um, took it from being um, something seen as uh, military wear to something that like spies would wear and it became like a secretive cool thing. Um, and yeah, basically Hollywood did its job very well from like the 1940s onwards and the trench coat became again something that was seen on screen by these amazing actors playing these incredible characters that people like really admired or thought were really cool and everyone wanted to to look like them and again it's just a very practical coat and it's very stylish um and that's why it survived to today. So that is my absolute number one favourite coat. Um, I just absolutely love them. Um, and oh God, they're just so cool. But then I do love 1940s uh, style anyway. So um, that's all for today. I really hope you enjoyed this. I'm having a lot of fun making these. Um, I promised last time that I would find a way to share links with you. Now, I'm I'm still not I'm not massively up on YouTube and technology like I'll be honest uh, I do okay but I'm not an absolute whiz so what I think I'm going to do is um, to give you another way as well of having this information I'm gonna uh, do like a blog post on my website and I'll include links to podcasts films uh the articles that i've used i'll include them on there so you can just like you can read the blog post if you want it'll just kind of be maybe you know basically what i've said here um but if you prefer reading great and then you can just skip to the end for the uh links and extra sort of bits of information if that's what you're looking for uh so you can find that on uh, www.sowhatmanchester.com so that's s-e-w-w-h-a-t-m-c-r.com